Okay, so in this video we're going to take a look at the kinetic model of matter, looking at changes in state and changes in temperature. Um, so just in terms of what's on this test, we're going to be looking at uh, calculations with temperature change and phase change, but I'm also going to start looking at some Newton's second law and Subat type questions which will be useful to us when we look at kinetic theory, one of the next topics. So these are the things that are being assessed on this test. Let's dive straight in. Okay, so the first few questions are all multiple choice, uh, but there's some fairly tricky ones in here, so let's have a look. Um, so we've got the temperature of a hot liquid in a container falls at 2 Kelvin per minute uh, just before it begins to solidify. So we're looking at a temperature change, not a phase change there. Then the temperature stains remains steady for 20 minutes, um, which is, means there's a phase change happening there. After 20 minutes, it has completely solidified. So the phase change is finished. And it says you can assume that the rate of energy lost from the liquid remains constant. So um, what I've done is I've uh, created expressions for the rate of energy chain lost during either of the two scenarios. So here we've got an expression for the rate of energy loss during the phase change and here we've got an expression for the rate of energy loss during the temperature change. Um, so we know it's completely solidified after 20 minutes, so we know T is going to be 20, but we don't know what ML are. And during the temperature change, we know the rate of change of temperature is uh, 2 Kelvin per minute. So we can put in a 2 for this delta uh, te change in temperature over T time. So that's where this has come from. Uh, we says we should assume it remains constant, so we can make these two expressions equal to each other and rearrange to give you uh, C over L because that's what we've been asked for in the question. And if you do that correctly, you end up with 1 over 40 there. Um, in terms of solving this, you can also use dimensional analysis to solve this by looking at the units. So you've got a unit of uh, 2 Kelvin per minute and a unit of 20 meters. 20 minutes, and we need to turn that into 1 over Kelvin, so you can look at how you combine those two numbers to give you the unit you want as well. So that would work, um, but this method is what they're expecting. Um, so we've got a resistor with seven, 6 amps of current flowing through it. Uh, it's thermally insulated, so there's no uh, heat exchange with the surroundings, and a potential difference of 6 is applied to it for 2 minutes. Uh, we've got a thermal capacity, which is like a combination of specific heat capacity and mass, and we want the rise in temperature. So first off, we can work out how much energy is supplied using P e equals PT, which we can substitute in VIT as power is current times potential difference. So this is the total amount of energy. Uh, we want the change in temperature, so energy divided by the thermal capacity, or M times C, gives you 480 Kelvin, or 4.8 times 10 to the 2 to be more, to give it in standard form. Question 3, we've got a car of mass big M travelling at speed big V, and it comes to rest, so it's going to lose all of its kinetic energy. Uh, its energy is dissipated by the brake, and the brake discs have mass small m and specific heat capacity c. And we want the temperature rise. So first off, let's work out how much energy that is supplied to the brake pads. And that's going to be the kinetic energy of the vehicle. Uh, so then we're going to put that in for q and rearrange to find delta t. So here's the energy divided by m and c. Um, uh, a mistake a lot of people make is they cancel the m's here, not realizing that the masses are different. So if you do that correctly, you should end up with this expression right here. Okay, so we've got a raindrop falling to the ground at its terminal speed V, and we've got a specific heat capacity and acceleration of free fall G, and we know that 25% of the energy is stays within the raindrop. So 75% is lost to the surroundings, 25% stays in the raindrop. We want to know what the temperature change is. So first off, this is how much energy the raindrop has just before it hits the ground. And what we're going to do is this is going to be transferred into thermal energy. But it says it's only 25% efficient, which is where this quarter comes from. So the amount of energy supplied is this. 
Uh, change in temperature would be the energy divided by the mass and acidic heat capacity. So that's where the mass has gone uh, because the mass cancels out. And now we've got a C on the bottom line, giving you the answer D. Next one, starting to look at some mechanics. Which of the following statements is correct? The force acting on an object is equivalent to its change in momentum. No, change in momentum is an impulse, not a force. Uh, impulse per second is change in momentum per second, which is a force, as Newton's second law says force is equal to the rate of change in momentum. Uh, energy per second, no, that would be some sort of power. Uh, acceleration per meter would have the units of s to the minus 2, so I have no idea what that is, uh, but it's certainly not that one. Okay, so starting to look at the longer answer section, which statement explains why energy is needed to melt ice at zero degrees to water at zero degrees? So you should know that during a phase change process, the potential energy is changing, which means you're um, either stretching or breaking bonds. Uh, so if you go from ice to water, you're going to break some of the intermolecular bonds between water. So we haven't broken all of them, because that would be turning it into a gas, but we are going to break some of them, which is what allows the atoms to move freely uh, about each other. So we're going to have a look at um, a practical application of some of this uh, heat and temperature work. So we've got an experiment to measure specific heat capacity of ice. Uh, so we've got ice at minus 25 degrees, which we've put in water. We've stirred it to make sure it um, essentially is going to be evenly spread out. Uh, the, the heat gets evenly distributed amongst the whole system. And we keep adding ice until, sorry, it's stirred until all the ice is melted and the temperature of the water is now zero. And then therefore at thermal equilibrium, the temperature of the ice would also be zero. So we need to calculate the energy required to melt the ice at a temperature of zero degrees. So that's what this equation is for. It calculates how much energy is needed to change the phase of something. And we get this answer answer here. So I'd express that in standard form to two significant figures because the data we've used to calculate it is two significant figures. So then it says, because of the temperature change, the water loses this amount of energy. Calculate the energy given to the ice to raise its temperature. So we know how much energy is required to change the phase of the ice, and we know how much the total amount of energy it's received is. So the difference between those two numbers would have to be the amount of energy to raise the temperature of the ice. So that's what we've done there. I'm using the unrounded answer from the first part, which gives you this answer right here, which the two significant figures is 2,500 or 2.5 times 10 to the 3. Now, we've got the amount of energy supplied to change the temperature, and we've got the mass, and we know what temperature change is. It's gone from minus 25 to zero, so a temperature change of 25. So we can calculate what the specific heat capacity is measured in joules per kilogram per Kelvin. This could be a degree centigrade, but let's get into the habit of using uh, standard units, which would be Kelvin here. Okay, so lead has a specific heat capacity of 130 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. What does that mean? That means it takes 130 joules of energy to increase the temperature of one kilogram of lead by one degree Kelvin. So the people who lost this mark typically didn't have this part in here. So they didn't take the opportunity to be more specific and they gave a general definition. So just be careful with that. So we've got lead of mass uh, 0.75 kilograms heated from 21 degrees uh, to its melting point, which is uh, 3327.5 here. Uh, and then it's heated until it's all melted. How much energy is supplied to the lead? Uh, we want to give it to an appropriate number of significant figures. So um, first off, in terms of the amount of energy, we're going to need to supply some energy to raise its temperature and some energy to change its phase. So that's where this expression comes from. I factorise out the mass because the mass is the same. Um, and then the temperature change has gone from 21 to 327.5. So this is the temperature change. And then this is the specific latent heat effusion. Add those two numbers together and it will be 4.7 times 10 to the 4 to two significant figures because we're using values which are two significant figures to calculate the answer.
Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So we've got the now melted or liquid lead at a temperature of 327 and we pour it into an iron mold. So we're trying to turn it into something using a mold. And the mold's temperature changes by this much and it's now in thermal equilibrium. So they're now going to be at the same temperature, which means the lead will also now be at 84 degrees centigrade. So we've got some data to calculate it. So we've got the heat energy absorbed by the iron mold. So we need the mass of the iron, specific heat capacity of the iron, and the temperature change of the iron, which we've got here. And again, giving it to two significant figures would be appropriate, because these are two significant figure values. We want to calculate the heat energy given out by the lead when it's changing state. So we're going to use this equation right here. The mass of lead and the uh, latent heat of fusion of lead gives us an answer of this. So then it wants us to calculate specific heat capacity of lead. So first off, we need to work out how much thermal energy is used to change the temperature, which is why I'm finding the difference between these values. So this number here is how much the total energy uh, gained by the iron is. This is how much is lost by the lead during phase change. So this is how much is lost by the lead due to its temperature change. Once we know that, we can put it into this equation here, giving us an answer of 155, blah, 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 which would be 1.6 times 10 to the 2, to two significant figures there. Uh, but when you calculate the answer, you should end up with 155 point something or other. And in terms of a reason why it's only an approximation, in all of this thermal physics stuff, we're assuming there is no heat exchange with the surrounding. So all of the energy from lead is transferred to energy in the iron. Um, so we're assuming there's no heat transfer to the surroundings, but that does mean there's an assumption we're making. The other thing we're assuming is that specific heat capacity stays the same. Um, for most materials, it actually doesn't. Uh, once we make a big temperature change. So we're actually assuming this one as well in this part of our calculation. Okay, so now we're gonna have a look at a flow type temperature problem. Uh, so we've got an electric shower and we've got it heating water and we've got a flow rate or a volumetric flow rate measured in meters cubed per second. And it wants the mass per second or the mass flow rate. So. We know to go from volume to mass, we times by density. So to go from volume flow rate to mass flow rate, again, we multiply by the density. So density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. This is how many meters cubed we've got. So it gives us a mass flow rate in kilograms per second. Uh, we want, then want the power supplied to do that. So we know Q equals mc delta t, which means power is going to be mc delta t divided by the time. So what we can do is we've got mass flow rate, so we can put the time in here. And so we've got mass flow rate times civic heat capacity times temperature change gives us 6,980 blah, 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 which would be 7.0 times 10 to the 3 to two significant figures here. Um, so then we're going to bring in some mechanics from year 12. So the jet emerges horizontally at a speed of 2.5 meters per second. Um, so in terms of what that looks like, that means in the vertical direction, its velocity is zero. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is work out how long it takes to hit the ground. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm figuring out how long it will take to hit the ground. So we know it's two meters above the floor, and we know the acceleration due to gravity is minus 9.281. So we can figure out how long it will take to hit the floor, putting in u equals zero, because in the vertical direction, the initial velocity is zero. Then we're gonna use that time in the horizontal direction. So in the horizontal direction, acceleration is zero because there are no forces acting in the horizontal direction because we're saying air resistance is negligible. So we simplify the equation to this and then we multiply the horizontal velocity by the time, gives us 1.5 blah, 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 which would be 1.6 meters to two significant figures. 
So the next question is looking at an experiment to measure the specific heat capacity of a metal block. So this is an experiment that you should know and be able to explain. Uh, the first stage is drawing a diagram. So in order to do this, we're going to need to work out the thermal energy supplied to the block. So we need some mechanism for measuring energy, and we're going to do that by measuring the electrical power and multiplying it by the time. So that's why we've got an ammeter and a voltmeter. Uh, your voltmeter in parallel with your heater, your uh, ammeter in series. And then what we've got is our steel block with an immersion heater embedded in it and a thermometer also embedded in it to measure the temperature. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure the initial temperature of the block because we're going to need that. That's going to be our first point on the graph when T equals zero, uh, we're at this temperature. And then we're going to turn the supply on uh, to about 12 volts typically. And we're going to record the temperature every 30 seconds until we get a 10 degree temperature change. So we want a nice big temperature change to do this over. So I'm going to do it for 10 degrees. Anything bigger than that would be fine. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to monitor potential difference in current because in this experiment we're going to assume the power stays the same so we need to check that it does. So what I'm going to do is record potential difference in current at the start and the end and I have an average value for those two over the whole experiment. So for each time what I'm going to do is work out how much thermal energy has been supplied using Q equals PT or Q equals IVT. So for every 30 seconds I'm going to calculate how much thermal energy has been supplied. So what I'm going to do is plot a graph of thermal energy on the y-axis against temperature on the x-axis. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do, let's have a graph. So we're going to have thermal energy supplied against the temperature of the block. So this is our general equation. So instead of delta T, I've put the temperature minus the initial temperature on here. So this is a general equation. So we can see that Q is going to be our Y variable. T is our X variable, which makes this MC our gradient of the graph. So uh, what we'd expect to get is a graph that's a straight line like this, where this would be our like initial, or what am I doing? That's absolute rubbish. So we're going to have some sort of initial temperature, sort of, it's going to go like this. Uh, so then this point here would be MCTI. Uh, if I extend the graph down, that would be your y-intercept because we can see we've got a plus c term here when we multiply that all out. This would just be your initial temperature. So when we have supplied no energy, this would be your initial temperature. And then the gradient of this graph would be the mass times the civic heat capacity. So if we measure the mass of the block using a balance or a mass balance, We'll take the gradient, divide it by the mass, and that will give us the specific heat capacity of the block. There are other ways of doing this with slightly different graphs. Uh, I've seen some people do this with a temperature versus time graph, for instance. As long as you explain how you're going to determine specific heat capacity from your graph, that can be fine. And another point a lot of people made, which was really good, is to say that they would take steps to thermally insulate the block. Again, a good thing to say and would have been worth some credit for this question. Okay, so that's how we've measured specific heat capacity of a metal block. So this final question is going to look at some of our Newton's laws, because we're going to need those in the next part of the topic. So the first one, uh, looking at, we've got air coming in here, and then it comes out of the other side at higher speed. So he wants us to state what happens to the momentum of the air. Well, the mass of the air isn't changing. It's still got the same air particles coming out as we've got going in. So we must increase the momentum if we increase the velocity. So in terms of stating it, it increases. A lot of people gave a lot more information here. That is totally unnecessary. It just says state. This next part was, generally speaking, not done very well at all. So explain using laws of motion. So what that means is, using Newton's laws, why the air exerts a force on the engine in the forward direction. So if we look at our diagram, 
So what's happening is the air is going slow and then it's going fast. So the air must have experienced a force to the right because it's, it's increased its velocity to the right. Therefore, the engine must have experienced a force to the left. That's what Newton's third law tells us. So let's look at how we'd explain that. So first of all, the air experiences, I don't know why it says and, uh, let's correct that now, and uh, impulse to the right because its momentum towards the right has increased. So its impulse is to the right. So according to Newton's third law, the engine must have experienced an equal and opposite impulse to the left. That's, so Newton's third law tells us when two objects interact with each other, if one experiences a certain force from the other, the original object experiences an equal and opposite force in the opposite direction. So if the air experiences a force to the right, the engine must experience a force to the left, which is the forward direction uh, in the diagram. Okay, um, so that is our, uh, explaining losing the laws of motion. Uh, next question, so in one second a mass of 210 kilograms enters and the speed of the air increases from 570 meters per sec by 570 meters per second. Calculate the force, so we're going to use Newton's second law. So the momentum change per second is the mass times the velocity change. So that's going to give us this value here, uh, which we're going to give to three significant figures because the data in the question is to three significant figures. So 1.20 times 10 to the 5. So we were looking at the takeoff phase. Now we're going to look at landing. So we can see what we've done is we've added in these deflector plates. So what happens is air comes in here, hits the plates and is direction is changed. So it's forced to go around this way. So it tells us the speed of the air leaving at B is the same as the speed of the deflected air. So the speed going in here is equal to the speed going around here. The speed never changes, but its direction does change. So um, the, momentum of the momentum of the air must have changed because its direction has changed. And why is that? It's because momentum is a vector quantity. So if its direction changes, that means it has changed. So that's what it's looking for there. So the next one, they want, we've, got, we've got a total force uh, which is acting against the motion of 190 kilonewtons. Calculate the deceleration. So the reason this number is positive in here is because it said calculate deceleration, not acceleration. Uh, so force divided by mass would give us the deceleration, which to two significant figures is 2.7 meters per second squared. Okay, so for the next question, we're going to put that acceleration to use. We're going to calculate how far it takes the uh, plane to stop if it lands at 68 meters per second. So key things, acceleration is going to be minus 2.7 because it's in the opposite direction to the initial velocity. And we want to find out the displacement, but we don't know how long it takes. So we're going to use this equation, rearrange an algebraic form plug our numbers in and we end up with uh, like 850 odd but two significant figures because this data is two significant figures would be 8.5 times 10 to the 2 meters. So suggest in practice why the decelerating force provided by the deflector plates will not remain constant. So uh, as the aircraft slows down the mass flow rate of air into the engine is going to decrease. So the reason air goes into the engine is because the engine is going forward into the air. That's why air goes in. If the speed of the engine decreases, the rate at which air is forced into the engine is going to decrease. So if we think about the calculations we did earlier, if we have a smaller mass flow rate, that means we're going to get a smaller rate of change of momentum of the air particles. So that's going to give us a smaller force acting against the motion there. Okay, so that concludes this uh, video reviewing the, this first test on the first topic. If you have any questions on the on this, please do feel free to comment on this video and let me know and ask so I can get back to you. But thank you for taking the time to watch.